Okay, <clears throat> let's regroup here and see how we did. <coughs> so one should have been easy. Uh, just finding the x, the, the ordered pair at negative two, and then confirming that that's what the graph shows. So uh, <coughs> number two, so dx dt is going to be taking derivative of x with respect to t. So I get three t squared minus six t, plugging in negative two. I got twenty four. Did you get twenty four? Okay, lots of nuts. Okay, cool. Now the the real important thing is, can we articulate what twenty four means after two semesters of calculus? So. Yes, it is the rate of change of x with respect to t. Yes, that's what it is. But what does that mean? What does that mean? Matthew, you know? So given any change in t, the corresponding change in x would be 24. The change in x would be 24. Almost. So it's going to depend on the change in t, right? So if it's the change in x can't always be 24. It's going to depend on the change in t. <coughs> so, go ahead. So if the 24 is the rate of change, x is the change in t, right? Right. Given any change in t, so this is, <coughs> if, you, if you haven't gotten it by now, now's, now today's your day. This is your day to understand what a rate of change is. Given any change in your independent variable, right? Given any change in your independent variable, your change in your dependent variable, which before was y, but in dx dt, our dependent variable is x, right? So the change in x is? What would it be? 24 times as great, right? 24 times as great as whatever you pick for your little change in t. Now, that, but that's close to this, in this vicinity of this point, right? As soon as we move away from this point, what could happen? dx dt could be different, right? So we're talking about a small, a small change in for us uh, for some neighborhood of this point where x is negative 19 and y is negative 14, around t equals negative 2. We can make this assumption. And that's the meaning of that 24. <coughs> So as t, right here around t equals negative 2, as t changes, what does that tell us about what's going on, right? So as t changes around t equals negative 2, just broadly, so what's happening here? What's going on? What does that tell us? Dx, the x is holding constant. x is going down. All right, you're just shaking your head, so... Tell me. Okay, so it tells us that if t increases, x increases, right? And how does it increase? Just a little bit. Just increases a little bit, right? If you increase t, then x just increases a little bit, right? No. 24 times as much as whatever you choose for t. It's going, it's shooting up, right? X shoots up for a little change in t. You get 24 times that change in t as your change in x. X is soaring up, I mean, relatively speaking, relative to like 1 or relative to 2, okay? So not relative to 1,000, but, okay? But if, we, if, our, if our kind of our reference point is like a rate of change of 1 or something like this, x is increasing really fast compared to a rate of change of 1. So a little change in t, x skyrockets, right? Question over here. Close to negative 2. In the in a small vicinity around negative 2. Yeah, in the moment. So so we call this in the moment. A moment means a small interval at that x value. Yeah. So we so if, if we take a small enough what we call moment or interval, then we assume a constant rate of change within that interval. It has to be small. You're exactly right, because as soon as you move away from, from where t was negative 2, that rate could be different. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So it doesn't make sense. Given any change in t, your change in x is going to be 24 times that change in t. So relative to a rate of change of 1, x is increasing rapidly compared to 
with a small change in t. All right, so now that tells us then what the orientation of this curve is, right? So the orientation could be one of two things. As t increases, we could be generating points up and to the right, or we could be generating points down and to the left. I think we talked about this last week, right, a little bit? So which is it? Is it up and to the right or down and to the left? And how do you know that? This tells us that its points are being generated which direction? To the right, right? To the right, because if so, x is increasing for a change in t. So going to the right means on this curve would have to be this way. Does it make sense? Okay. Prediction for dy dx. So that's not dy dt or dx dt, but dy dx at t equals negative two. So what did you predict dy dx would be on this curve? So if dx dt is given a small change in t, how much um, x changes? Then what is dy dx? People are saying 2 or 2.5. So how would we do that? We'd say, so, so this kind of takes, it takes uh, t out of the, the equation. It's kind of like we have just a normal function again. Y is a function of x, or one we're, we're more used to. So we're asking, how much does y change for a change in x? So given a small change in x, how much does y change? compared to that. So dy equals positive or negative? Positive because y goes up, right? So for, for an x increase, y increases. And so how much, how many times greater is dy? And we're just estimating about how many times greater is dy or times dx? About two. Okay, so 2, 2.5, something around 2. All right, now we need to devise a way to find, and we want to get this exactly. We want to get this dy dx exactly. So we need to write y as a function of x, right? I think you did an example on Wednesday where you, what, you wrote one in terms of t and plugged it in, right? So you could get y as a function of x. Did we do that? I think you said you did that. So we're going to do that here. X is t cubed minus 3t squared plus 1. Y is this quartic polynomial. How about writing y as a function of x? Yeah, a mess would be stating it lightly, light, lightly, right? The big, oh, no, not that. <laughs> I'm so, it would be. The biggest frown I could draw, right? Not a smiley face. This is the biggest frown I could draw, right? So that, like, this is would be awful to write. Try to write t in terms of x, and then plug that in to the down, the one down the bottom to get y as a function of x. So this is not the way to go. Okay, so I like the first thing you said. If we if we had dy dt, okay. Okay. No, so. So let's put this where it belongs here. So she's suggesting dy dt over dx dt. What about that? Can we think about the dt's canceling out? Is that valid? Sure, because the way we think about rate of change, we're thinking about it this way. Like, 
say um, array one. We're separating them here. Right, we found that that, that rate right there was 24, right? And we're defining it as given a change in t, right? Let t change a little bit all by itself. It's not necessarily have to be hooked into the dx, right? Let t change a little bit. That's a valid, valid quantity. We know what the resulting dx would be as a valid quantity. So we can absolutely think of these as ratios of two values. And that being said, yeah, so the, the math works out too. The dt's go away, and you get dy dx. Right, but the key distinction here is these, both dy dt and dx dt are in terms of t, so your dy dx is still a function of t. So when you do that, so what was uh, dy dt? Negative, if I heard that right, negative 18 to the third minus 60 plus 6 to the third, two to six, plus 1, all over. Okay, and so we know at negative 2, so now we can use this at negative 2. Again. Okay, so what do we get? So we know um, the denominator is 24. What was the numerator? What do you get? 51. So we'll just leave it at that. Are they, these both divided by 3, right? 17 eighths. And is that close to 2? Just a little bit bigger than 2, right? So our prediction was good of 2. That's a little bit bigger than 2. So it's still the same dy dx that we saw in Calc 1, but now, because each of these are defined in terms of t, that thing is defined in terms of t as well. All right, so the equation of the tangent line, we have the point, right? So what's our point? Negative 14, negative 19. And rate of change? That's easy. There we go. Negative 19, negative 14. Rate of change, 17 eighths. I'll let you finish that. It's easy. Write the equation of the line given a point and the rate of change. So that's not the answer, but you're home free. That's something you've done many times. Questions so far, up through six. Is this making sense? Any questions? Let's see. Okay, so I gotta, we're going to do a little bit together, and then we'll go to part two. So this graph, actually, So here's what, if you look more near the origin, this is what you see for this graph. So question here, is this a function? Is this a function? Yes or no, is this a function? So I want you to, I want you to explain to the person you're working with how you could answer that question as yes and how you can answer that question as no. Depends on, you have to qualify, right? You have to be more specific. That could be yes, that could be no. Go. Okay, let's see what you guys said. So, Chloe, you get to choose. You can answer it as yes or no. Which do you choose? Go with either yes, it is a function, or no, it's not. And why? You can choose. What's that? Okay, it's function of t. Is it a function of t? And then what's the dependent thing that comes out of that function? If t goes in, then what comes out? An x and a y, right? So if t goes in, then an x and y come out. And that is a valid function because for every value of t, do you get one distinct ordered pair, x and y? Yes. So 
t goes in and x and y comes out, then that is a valid function. For any given t, there's only one order pair x and y that you'll get. Okay. What about, and what if it crossed on itself? Would it be a valid function then? So if this thing came around, let's like say it did that. Would it be a valid function? For every value of t, there's only one ordered pair, x and y. Does that violate that? All right, so maybe this is t equals 1, t equals 3. So maybe right there, say t equals 0, coming this way. But then later, it's t equals 6. See what I'm saying? So it's going gonna, it's gonna to come around this way for increasing t. It's going to hit that point at 0, and then it's going to hit that point again at 6. Valid function or no? You're saying yes. Why are you saying yes? So for t equals 0, do you get one and only one ordered pair? Yes, you get an ordered pair, x and y. When t equals 6, do you get one and only ordered pair, x and y? <coughs> yes. What's the problem? What violates a function? What, what's the, what will violate the rule for function? Given a t, you get two points. That doesn't violate that. For every, give, or every single t, there's only one ordered pair associated with that t. Now, it ends up being the same ordered pair for two different t's, but that doesn't violate a function. Make sense? So it's kind of just like a normal function having the same y value. I mean, this is the same situation as, is that a valid function? Well, what about this y value? You hit it many times. See? That's, this is a perfectly valid function. For different x's, you can have the same y. That's fine. It's just for a given x, you can't have more than one y. Same thing here. For a given t, you can't have more than one ordered pair. And you don't. You don't. At t equals 0, you get an ordered pair. At t equals 6, you get one ordered pair. It just happens to be the same. Does that make sense? OK. So uh, let's talk about this one. I want to I wanna isolate this point right here. The highest point. I want to find everything I want to know about the highest point on this graph. How am I going to do it? So what's true right there? Junkie, what would be true right there? It would help me find that point, the highest point. <coughs> Yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, so we've got actually three rates of changes that we're talking about here, right? dx dt, dy dt, and dy dx. So, for it, so that would say that for a change in t, x doesn't change. Is that right? But for a little change in t right there, x does not change. Is that what you want? Why? Miranda, you were, what do you think? Which one? What do you think? What's that? So he said dx dt should be zero, and I thought you shook your head. Did you shake your head? You didn't. Okay. So what's, what are we going to do to figure out what that highest point is? For a change in t, we want what? For a change in t around there, we want it, what to happen? Do we want x to be the change in x to be zero? Change in y to be zero, right? Change in y to be zero. It's not so for that highest point, right around that highest point, when t changes, y doesn't change. There's zero change in y. So we can do to make this the easiest, we're gonna do what? dy dt equal to zero. And what was our dy dt again? Okay, and so that's not algebraically, that's not easy. So we could use a graphical approach or something. We're going to find all values of t that make this true. So we could, say, use a graph. 
but we won't take the time to do that. If it were a quadratic or linear, then it'd be easy to solve for what t values make it zero, right? Okay, but this is cubic, so we need some other method, like graph method, or we like gc because it locks onto the maxes. And so the, actually the highest point, if we were to solve that, we would get, it says what? Negative 0.9, 3, 9, negative 0.94. But I want to know everything about that point. So how high does it get? How, how would I find out how high it gets? What would I do? Find the corresponding y, right? And then if I want to know what this x value is, same thing. And it, so it says it here. But if we just got the t value algebraically, then we from the from the function we could find the corresponding x and y. Is this the only t value that's going to make that zero? Where else? How many more? Tell me when to stop. Oh, what happened? Oh, here we go. So where else do we expect, for what t values do we expect to get zero? The bottom of that point there, right? It's going to curve on real fast, but at the bottom of that, and then also the little local maximum right there. And indeed, you get from this, from this right here, you get three t values. You get three t values that make it zero, and it's those three what horizontal tangents, right? So for a change in t, y doesn't change. That's going to be local maxes and local mins in the x y plane. Okay, so I want you to find now. You can do part two. I want you to find the rightmost point of this. The rightmost point of this curve. That's part two, right? Is that the first question, part two? Okay, just do part two. Find the rightmost point, all algebraically, no technology. Yeah, sure. Oh. Does someone else not get both sides? Everyone got a two-sided copy? Okay, keep going. Okay, so you should have gotten two t values, right? That make zero, the x t t zero. So how do you know which one? Why and why are there two? Shouldn't there just be one? How do you know which one? First of all, so how do we know which one is the the rightmost point? Which is like it's almost like an anteater, right? If an anteater ran into a wall, where would he touch, right? How do you know which one it is? Okay. So, so you, yeah, you could find the x values associated with each of those and then see which one we got the graph, right? So which one of those, t equals 0 or t equals 2, gives you an x value of, looks like something around 1, right? Which one is it? 0. Okay, 0 gives you the point. What point is it? 1, 4. So that's the one we were expecting to get. So why is there another one? The leftmost point. Is there where? So do you see anywhere else here where, for a change in t, x doesn't change? Yeah. So it's not being shown. So there is another place, but it's not being shown. So if we zoom out, everyone see how at t equals zero, we get the point one four, and that's the rightmost point. First of all, we good with that? Okay. So if we zoom out. What starts to happen here? Oh, the 
let's go the right way. So do you see now? Can you see there's another what vertical? So DX DX DT zero would mean you're heading vertically, right? For just a moment. You see where the other one is? So would anyone plug in T equals two? Negative three and so there it is. Right there, you got another one for t equals two. You get negative three and negative eighteen. But we just couldn't see it, right? So when you get the right view of it, you see there's another place where t changes a little bit. Your y doesn't change at all, right? Your x doesn't change at all. Your x doesn't change. Okay, last part. Okay, so for time's sake, we've got to do this together fast. So t equals 1 gives you the point. Anyone got it yet? Negative 1, positive 4. Okay. So now, we want to predict uh, whether dx dt, so remember uh, at negative 2, which was down here on this part here, so suppose this was t equals negative 2, but it's not. It's kind of a part like this. Which was the direction of the curve? It's this way, right? When we did t equals negative 2, it was off, it's off the screen now, but the general idea was, was that part of the curve and the direction of the curve was this way. So what about dx dt? and dy dt, positive, negative, or zero? So, so am I going to put greater than, equal to, or less than for, say, dx dt? Greater than, less than, or equal to zero at t equals one. Any volunteers? Yes, sir. Okay. So, based on what we found at the beginning, that the, the orientation of this curve is this way, up around like clockwise, right? Clockwise around the head of the anteater, okay? So that means that t equals 1, for increasing t, our points are being generated down and to the left. So that means dx dt is negative. For a change in t, your x decreases. You're going that way. And for a change in t, your y also decreases because you're going down. Does that make sense? So what about dy dx? Positive, negative, or zero. So you could, yeah, you could reason, reason it two ways. We know that it's dy dt over dx dt, so it would be a negative divided by a negative. Or which way for, for, so now this is regardless of t. For a positive change in x going this way, right, for dx, does y go up or down? That's what we're saying. Up. Even though the curve is, is generated this way for increasing t, this doesn't have to do with t anymore. It means given a change in x, which is a positive change this way, y would go up. So dy dx is positive. And you can confirm that. If you want to plug 1 into all, we have all those functions now. Plug 1 into dx dt, dy dt, dy dx, you'll find that your values agree with this. Okay, quickly, the second derivative. So at that point, what about the second derivative? Who remembers their calc 1? Second derivative with respect to x, right? So d, this one, essentially means y double prime. y double prime with respect to x. Positive, negative, or zero? So 
this is how how is the rate changing, right? So if we're going for for in, x increasing this way, is the rate increasing or decreasing? We've got a positive rate, and that positive rate is decreasing. Do you see that the rate of change is getting less? Therefore, we expect this to be less than zero. The rate of change is decreasing. These tell us how the coordinates increase or decrease, right? But then the, the second derivative tells us how the rate is increasing or decreasing. Okay, so how do you find the rate? So we did, for the first derivative, do this fast, dy dx we said was dy dt divided by dx dt. And what did we get? We got a function of t. I'll just call it capital F. So now when we do the second derivative, we can't just take this with respect to t because the second derivative is with respect to x, right? So we do the same thing we did before. We're going to take, so it's the exact same thing. We're going to take the derivative of this whole thing with respect to t. So we're going to take our result, and that's that's f, right? This dy dx is a function of t. I'm going to take the derivative of that with respect to t. But then I need to divide that by dx dt. So that, again, the, d, the dt's would cancel out, and I get the derivative of y with respect to x twice. Right? So that's the I have one minute left to explain the to you version. So the second derivative, you're going to take your first dy dx, you're going to take that with respect to t, because it is a function of t. But then you need to, just like we did here, you need to divide by dx dt. And that gives you the second derivative. So what was dy dx? It was, so let's write it out. What was dy dx? Negative 8t cubed, 6t minus 1 all over 3t squared minus 6t. So what kind of thing is that? And t, that's a quotient. And so for the numerator, I have to take the derivative of that with respect to t. So how am I going to take the derivative of that with respect to t for the numerator of this thing? Quotient rule. If you can't simplify this, so try to simplify this first. If you can't simplify it, you're going to need quotient rule to get this numerator. And then you're going to take that quotient rule and divide by dx dt again. And that's our second derivative. And if we plugged t equals 1 into that, we would expect a negative value, like we predicted. 